Welcome to the TDN Podcast. This is Thoroughbred People with Patty Wolf. I am Patty Wolf. Does that need saying? Today, I'm super excited to have Terry Finley, the CEO and president of West Point Thoroughbreds, here in our home office. We have so many questions for Terry about the industry, about West Point. Welcome, Terry. It's great to be here. Thank you, Patty. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, Terry, it's almost difficult to know where to start. Um, where do you feel uh, the largest challenges uh, lie for the industry? Well, I think if uh, if the two of us sat here a year ago, we'd ha- we'd have other th- you know a lot of other other things to talk about. You know, really, there are challenges, right? We're 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 faced with challenges, and uh, they're it's they're all over the country, all over the world. But you know, we're focused in uh, you know, with the challenges that we have in America, and um, I'd like to think you know that we'll really have a chance over the next you know, either year or two or three years that all of us will have a chance to see if, if, if I were as good as we think we are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this year, obviously, when you said if we had talked last year, it might be different this year. It's all about horse safety. Are we doing enough? What do we, where do we need to be going? Um, we're not doing enough. Right. And that's, um, I latched on to something that a jockey in California, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't remember who it was, but they talked about, our culture and the fact that our culture right really needed adjusting and improving and i think we're all faced with that we're all faced with really you know the introspection of engaging right how we individually and as an industry improve that culture and look at it, it's it's a painful process Right. There's no doubt. It's a pain. It's a painful process. I think we'll do best by not pointing fingers and by you know, taking care of our own business while sharing in the um, in the in the battle, so to speak, to make our industry better. I know when I say that, I know, you know, that I might think it's corporate speak and it is to a certain extent. But I think every, everybody who's in the business, I think we know, right, that culture wasn't as good as it, as it should have been. And it's going to get better. And, and really, that road, I believe, is, gonna, is not going to be straight, right? It's going to be a winding road. But we continue. And if we do what we say and, and we hold ourselves accountable to always putting the horse at the top of the pyramid, I think things are going to work out. Now, there's a, a lot of other factors involved. It's a multifactorial issue. I, I use that word a lot, you know, especially since last spring. But it is a multifactorial challenge. When I lay my head down at night, you know, there is a comfort level that we as an industry are up to the challenge. And... I don't want to be cute and say, I hope we are, but I do hope we are because um, there are a lot of people uh, that depend and and derive all kinds of things, you know, out of the industry. And, um, you know, the thought of in 10 years having a stronger, a more efficient industry with a better culture in 10 years, I'll be 65. That's a pursuit that everybody that I know is really looking forward to and saying like, we, we have our destiny in our hands and really in life, right? This crazy thing we call life. What other spot do you want to be in except in a spot that you control your own destiny as much as possible? And I'd like to think that's where we're at. I hope so. I hope so. Thanks for the downer that I'll be 65 in 10 years, by the way. <laughs> Famous only to us. We're the same age, same graduating class. You've got a two a two part to this horse safety. It's to do the best we can. We can't deliver on the promise of zero injuries, zero ca- casualties. It's impossible. We can't deliver on that for little league football, you know, or or, or a- any sport. Um, we can't deliver on that. We can do the best we can. But we also have the image problem. You also have the people who I think at this point are expecting that zero. Sure. That's probably at the top of our list, 
right? The, the, the caveat, you know, every time we start, when we're talking to somebody, right, that is interested in our business, um, and the things that are happening, that's a, that's a tough thing to always have to include that caveat up front. We, we know we strive for zero, but it's not reality to think we're going to get the zero. When I think about it, right, we don't have the resources in the industry to change every heart and mind of every American, uh, and every person in, on, on the planet earth. So I think Right, the more strategic that we are with our messaging, right, uh, to target the people that we we really really want uh, to alter their thinking and to to impress upon them that we're we're really we really do care about these sources. You know, Gary Stevens he said the other day very eloquently on on a CBS, he said we care about these sources, and I I could just feel the emotion, and it's one of the things that. I'm proud of the industry about I'm, I'm, a, I'm proud of a lot of things about our industry because we're survivors and, 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 but, but the, the, the thing about it is, is the authenticity that I see all over the place and authenticity is like, you know, people might not agree with you and they might have a position that right. It is not in sync, but if you're authentic and right, people know that you're putting the effort in, the thought and the action, uh, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And, and look, I, I, I'm just going to assume that the American public and the people, the powers that be, um, are going to see in the coming months and years that we are serious about changing our culture and about taking care of these other beautiful horses that we're entrusted uh, to care for. I mean, I, I was initially attracted to the business because all I met in the business was animal lovers. I, everybody, that was the one commonality that I would find um, in, in every uh, aspect. But if I meet people on the street or people that are not inside the industry whatsoever, they don't see it that way. Do you run across that? When you were talking at Goldman Sachs, do you run across people who assume that this is not a business of animal lovers? Sure. And, and, and really... Uh, there are cynics, right? And you know, I find if you're if you're a cynic on an area or two in your life, you're probably a cynic overall. And so I, I guess you know you get a little bit older and you you and you realize our job is not to to change every single person, right? And we're not because that's uh, that's a pursuit that really is you know you run up into a brick wall. And so yes, there are some you know, knuckleheads, but they deserve their opinion. They, Hey, they didn't get that opinion because everything was great in our business. They got, they got that. They, they derive that opinion and that outlook towards us. And I think we have to, to take that in to consideration and know that, you know, public opinion is, I think more important now than ever. And, and so it's a, it's a new world for us, right? Because for a long time, we, we were like, nah, public opinion, nah, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Or, you know, let's uh, try to win the Derby or let's, let's, let's try to improve our lot or whatever. Um, and, and now public opinion is smack dab right in the middle of our existence. And it's not going away. And there's nothing we, we can't pay to have it go away. We can't do an op-ed in the in the Wall Street Journal. It's going to take the hearts and minds of every single person in our industry uh, to continue to to do the right thing day after day after day. Right there, there are no silver bullets. I, I was talking to Joe Applebaum, uh, the president of Anitha, on my way down, and we were talking about you know what do we convey to people, and that's what that's what we we want to convey. And I think most people know it. there's no one thing, right? There's no statesman that's going to come in and really make a proclamation. All of our problems are going to go away. It's every day, every day thinking and then acting in a in a prudent way um, and taking care of our business. And I think if we do that, the cumulative effect of that, um, I think in you know, two or three years, 
I think it'll take that long, but we'll see, we'll see the light at the end of the tunnel and we'll look back and we'll look at 2019 as, as a watershed year that really instigated the change for the better in our industry. I just, I'm going to do everything I can. And, and the people that I work with, you know, my team, we vowed, we're going to do everything we can to play our part in that. And I'd ask everybody in the industry, like, all right, we got the problems identified. We got all the finger pointing done. Let's, let's get, let's t- take action. Let's get after this thing. Cause we got a good road and, and we have a good story to tell. All hands on deck. All hands on deck. I mean, well, that's a Navy term, but I'm from the Army. But <laughs> oh, no, oh no, I stepped in that one. <laughs> yes, oh, you did. Oh boy, um, are we doing a good job right now of that? Do you think of, of? Um, that's a great question. I think it would depend. On, to me, we're getting there. We're getting there, and there are plenty of people who say say no. But you know, I don't think anybody has bad intentions any of the powers that be. Now, that doesn't mean that structurally there shouldn't be changes or the 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 personal agendas shouldn't be identified and and brought to task. You know, those people brought to task. I get that. But overall, you know, look, this is a game of hope and dreams and we have the magic of the horse and look, I I know that this is a lot of people have opined on this and and look I know it sounds like a broken record but there's no other industry in the world that even comes close to having at its core at its core the magic that we have and that is in the form of the thoroughbred racehorse and so when we when we keep thinking about that that magic is really captivating I know it's captivating to me and you know, I, I started in business when I was 12 years old and I just I'm, I continue to be so captivated by these horses that that train and a big part of their lives uh, are focused on giving us pleasure. And, and you know, to to do anything that would take away from them is just not right. No, no, it isn't. It isn't right. I'm sitting here trying to work in the few, the proud. <laughs> Just teasing. Isn't that the Marines? Well, the Marines aren't, aren't as bad as the Navy guys. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was trying to say, how do I say the few, the proud, and get that in there? One of the things when you're talking to people not in the industry is um, their view of the crop and, and the whipping, and, and that might not be you know the best impression to leave. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, my, my outlook has evolved. My outlook has evolved. I'll, I'll start with an anecdote. Every year for the last 25 years, there are about 30 of us, right, that graduated from uh, West Point that go to Vegas. And, you know, I don't, I don't get there every year, but I get there, you know, four or five times, at, uh, you know, six times a decade. And we were watching a race, uh, I don't know, from Belmont. We all, all golfed and we came back and I get all of them to, uh, to the windows. I get all them to the, uh, the simulcast center and, and we had won a race and, one of my best friends, uh, Shane Downey, he goes, right, they all call me Finn Dog. He, he, he goes, Jesus Christ, Finn Dog, they're beating the shit out of those horses. And I didn't have a response. I, I didn't have a response. And I, I was like, I felt like a schmuck. Like this business that I, I, beat, I beat the drum so much and then have somebody, a dear, dear friend in front of everybody. And, and so that, probably got me started thinking about this and then as as right, things have evolved look i know there are two there there are several different ways to look at it i think that the experiment like up at woodbine where they don't cock the stick it's very very interesting and look I, i've talked to jo- i've talked to a good number of jocks about this you know first they say well it's about safety and then they say the betters won't like it and then they say uh, the horses won't go through holes and then they, they won't pass. And I said, okay, well, let's just try. Look, we're, we're in the experimentation. You know, that's the, the, the other phase. So I think, I think that is a good middle ground. I respectfully disagree when I hear, no, 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 no. Let's just keep it uh, the way it is, but let's, let's get the industry to educate the public more. Well, I will tell you, that there's nothing you're going to be able to do with a little girl that's 
at the eighth pole at Saratoga and they hear that, you know, I can't even make the sound, but they hear it and, and, and they look up and they say, daddy, they're beating these horses. What kind of education are we going to, are we going to do to impact that little girl? And, and look, we got to change hearts and minds and that's a good place. And, you know, basically whether we like it or not, I think we're getting to a point in the very near future where we won't have a choice and, and it might be taken away. I mean, meaning that you won't be able to use it. I don't think they'll ever take it away because of safety, but I just asked the jocks, like, let's experiment. Let's like, you got to lead, you got to lead. Like we're all, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. So I, if it was up to me, I'd, I'd across the country, I do exactly what they're doing at Woodbine. And I wouldn't talk about it until 2021. You know, that's, I don't have the ability uh, to make that decision, but I'd strongly encourage people um, and the jocks and the, and the jockey guild um, uh, to support something like that. And, uh, but the, the tide is starting to turn. And I think everybody knows that. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, uh, it's, it's definitely one of the important topics on the table. So I'll talk right here and now uh, directly to Johnny V. There's no, there are very few people that I respect more inside or outside of the industry. Johnny, like you're a leader. You've done an incredible job as the leader of the, of the, the jockey guild. I really believe a lot of my, uh, a lot of fellow owners, a lot of my partners think that this is a golden opportunity for you to support the experiment right, that's going on at Woodbine. And if you wanted my input, I don't know if you do or not, but I would do it for a year and I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even talk about it again until uh, the calendar turns into 2021. And I think we'll all be pleasantly surprised that uh, the world won't fall apart and we'll be sending a much, optically, we'll be sending a, a much better signal to our public, to our fans and our fans of the future. Absolutely. It's a huge, huge issue right now. Absolutely. I think this, this solution or, or this issue is right, much better solved by us than by racing commissions across the country. Yeah, bingo. Bingo to that. Terry, you're a board member of NITA, which is the biggest horsemen's association uh, that we've got. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, very proud. You know, we, we have to give back. We have to give back in service. And, and look, it's not an easy job. And, and I'm, I'm just a board member. I, I, I look at the, the work and the number of hours, you know, Joe Applebaum and, and other, other presidents across the country and board members, right? Right. No one's get is in the position to make money because I don't think there's any, any board. And so it's all for, for, uh, for the betterment. Look, we don't always agree on everything. There's, you know, but we're not supposed to agree. We that's what the composition of a board is. You got owners and trainers, you got some at the higher level, some at the lower level. And so that dynamic, I think, is very, very good. And it's intriguing to me because, I, you know, one thing I've learned, especially in the last couple of years is, hey, you're not always right. You think you are with that's a human nature. You know, I've learned to be quiet and to shut up. And, and to listen and to say like, all right, I don't agree with that person, but right. Let me see if I can, I can figure out what they're basing their outlook on. And, and it's helped me. So look, I, I, I do it because I, I love, I love the, the industry and I want to give back. I want to make things better for, for owners and trainers. And I, I think we have in New York and, you know, just like any board, there's some things we we've done or, or we haven't got to yet that I wish, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get to in the future. But all in all, you know, things are, are looking up in a lot of ways in New York. But the, the inherent issues of, um, of our industry overall, they're certainly impacting us. You know, the horse shortage and the composition or the competition, especially in the Northeast. You know, that's, that'll continue to be an issue that is not going to you know, be worked out with a snap of a finger. But I will say this, I think there's opportunity uh, with the horsemen's groups around the country. And, and I'll, I'll formulate it like this, like there are some of them that have turned into fiefdoms, some of the, 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 the individual states and some of the, 
uh, the national organizations, right? And so it, it's got to be about accountability. And it, I'll give you an example. Like it really burns my bridges that I'm, I'm licensed, I think in 25 states or whatever. And, and so every, every couple months I'll get a ballot and I'll say, wait a second. I said, there, these people are on the ballot, right? Because they went through a nomination process. So you have my address or my email address to send me a ballot, but you didn't send me a nomination. Now, I know I'm not going to run for the board for California, but there are other people. And I, I would think that I'm not the, the only one not getting the nomination. So that's important. If we want to be a modern day industry, well, then you can't be a fiefdom. And you have to be transparent. And you, you know, when you, I'm, and I'll, I'm speaking directly to uh, the leaders of the horsemen's organizations. Look uh, to be more transparent in every aspect of your business and let every member of your organization know the dates and the requirements uh, to be nominated uh, to the board. And I think if we do uh, those uh, two things, I think people, especially owners, right? They'll look at these organizations, at the uh, the horsemen's organizations in a lot better light. Yeah, I think that's terrific. That's terrific advice. Um, there, there's a lot of talk over the last year or two, or maybe even longer, um, about one governing body for horse racing. But I think that it's become more popular uh, in the last year. Where do you stand yeah. on that? What are your thoughts on that? Well, if I had a magic wand in a magic world... <laughs> We're in Orlando, so it's the Magic Kingdom. Here we are. Um, I, I'd love to, you know, I don't know anybody that wouldn't love to see it. It's just not, by, it's not plausible. You, you have a public company, you have a private company, and you, you know, Naira is a public, private, quasi uh, type of company. So that's not going to happen. And, I, you know, hopefully we'll get a shot to talk about some things, in particular the federal bill, uh, which I'm, I'm a, an ardent supporter of. We can improve our structure. I just don't think we, we should look in five years at, you know, we look back and we say, we don't have a, uh, a commissioner's office and we failed. I don't think that that's a metric that we want to uh, lock on to, but you know, structurally we, we have some things, we have some targets of opportunity, uh, that we need to take advantage of. Good. We'll work your way right into the federal bill. Um, yes, I am a supporter of the federal bill, uh, uh, the horse racing integrity act. From a, a tactical standpoint, there are over 200 people in Congress that have signed on to support the bill. And there's a growing number uh, in the Senate, on the Senate side. So, look, it's gathering force. It's a you know gathering steam. I know there's a competing bill uh, in D.C., but it really is based on and it affords us an opportunity right, to create an independent entity. And I think that's important. I think when people, they look at our business, a lot of people look at it as a closed society and an old boys network. And that might have worked at some point in the past. But it ain't working now. And it won't work. We need independence. And I know we can get into the details and, and the nitty gritty of the composition of the board and everything. But, but USADA, the United States Anti-Doping Agency, affords us a chance to to do the good things right just like they've done with the olympics and the mma and cycling and they they've been advocates and they've been um uh, supporters and they've consulted with the nfl and the nba and the vast majority of other other professional sports leagues and really uh, travis tiger who i've gotten to know really respect um right makes a point that i think really encapsulates this Right. Travis says, I've been all over the world. I've studied, I've studied sports and industries and teams. He says, especially with industries, he said, it is impossible to police an industry while at the same time uh, promoting that industry. You can't police while you promote. And that's what we've had. Right. And I know it's not easy. Like who the heck wants to, to, to put anything in the hands of a quasi, you know, government, it's a nonprofit, it's not a government agency, but it's, it's affiliated with the government, but they have a proven track record of making things better. And that's what we need to do. 
That's what pe- owners and betters, especially, are are counting on us, the leaders in this industry, to do everything we can to make the playing field as level as possible. And I can tell you, just think about this. If you're a trainer or you're an owner, just think about it. I'll leave you with this on the federal bill. I know that USADA, they sleep, eat, and drink, right? Drug testing, in particular, out of competition testing and all the things that go with it. If anybody in our industry can look me in the eye and say that any of the 38 states, right, that operate racing, if any any of them, if the, if the leaders in the, in the gaming commission, if they're thinking about out of competition uh, testing, one, you know, fiftieth of the time that the people and the staff and the team at USADA are thinking about it, then I want to know who it is because I haven't found him. And this is this is big stuff. Like you, th- these, these pharmacologists and the um, the people who are trying to cheat, they're not pikers. They're sophisticated. Look at what's happening in Russia. Look at what's happening. You know, Lance Armstrong, he never failed a drug test. Barry Bonds, his head, it grew, <laughs> it grew three times or more, and he never failed a drug test. Like it's it's a system you have to fight fire with fire. And no one that I've run across, they they work seven days a week, 365 days a year. They put their heart and soul and their money into our business. And it's not a level playing field. And I say to them, like, do you really think we're on the road to a level playing field? Ah, blah, 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 blah. I said, here's a path that has proven with these other industries to have put the industry on a level playing field and the participants. That's all we want. I'm, I'm okay getting beat. We get beat eight times out of 10. We get beat. I'm all right with that. I just don't want... I don't want it, and I don't want anybody else in this industry to walk out of the out of the clubhouse on any day of the year with a pit in their stomach saying, I had the best horse, but I didn't win. Right. right. Not because I got in trouble. I got in a in a I got a bad start because I got outrun by a horse that was juiced. And if you don't think they are active in our industry, I respectfully think you're wrong. I think there's cheating going on in our industry and it pains the hell out of me to say that. And it pains the hell out of me that we haven't had a substantive response to the cheaters. And this is a path to offer more than a substantive response. And I just ask all the owners and trainers out there who are against uh, the federal bill to spend time and to call me or call anybody else that that is a supporter. You might not agree after we talk, Right, we not, might not be in agreement, but at least afford us a chance to explain our position because I think I know that the vast majority of people I've talked to after you after you lay things out, they say, "I see your point." Absolutely, absolutely. A little fairness goes a long way. Yes, uh, like a little. Fa- but this is a it's a, a big money pain. game. It's a big money game, and and um, you're circling back. It's really not fair to the horse. No. It's not fair. Like they're, 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 you, you, we all talk about, it. you know, horses, they, they get to the lead and then they win and they bow up, right? That's not fair. They, they have their, they have their confidence and they, you know, they're, they're strutting their stuff and let the best horse on that particular day win on the level. And that's what we say. And um, I, I think it's, I think the tide is turning. I really do. I think the tide is turning and look, I'll say it again. I think in a lot of respects, owners and trainers across the country have been sold a bill of goods, and it's time to send that bill of goods back exactly like you'd send an Amazon box that you didn't want back to Amazon. We can do better. We can do better. And we are better than this. And uh, I hope people, I I hope uh, that I'll see more and more people because it's coming. And I see it all over the country. More and more people joining the bandwagon. And it's a bandwagon that owners and trainers should be on. Yeah, absolutely. When you, you say not fair to the horse, um, it, it's also not safe for the horse not to regulate, right? I mean, that could get very dangerous. Sure. And we don't. Yes, that's 
you know, no one can say that that hasn't played a part in the problems that we've experienced. And um, I'll go back to the fact that it's a, a, a multifactorial, but that in and of itself isn't the problem. The issue is trying to address the individual factors. And here's a chance to address an individual factor in a tried and proven way. And, um, you know, quite frankly, I, I'm, I'm puzzled in a lot of respects how people that have devoted their life to our industry, who I respect immensely, aren't in accord. I'll continue to try to figure out ways uh, to convey to them the seriousness and the gravity of this situation, because I think it is a big part of, of the future. Whether we get this, if we get this right, I think it could be a big factor in our business really going in a, in a, a positive direction. I think if we don't get it right, it could play a bigger and bigger part of our demise. No, I don't want to hear that. But your arguments are, are surely compelling. Yeah, there's always a, a certain amount of regulation that's good, right? Over, yes. Over too much, none is chaos. When I look at, at the landscape across America, again, your regulators are well-intentioned in the 38 different states, right? But let me give you something that has stuck with me for a while. Ed Bowen, the esteemed uh, writer, wrote an article um, in uh, 2016 and he talked about a report that was published a while ago. He said, a related report in the same magazine set out the goals of, the, uh, of all the commissioners after they met in Miami Beach. And their statement was to encourage the adoption by state regulators of uniform procedures and reciprocity in enforcing rules regulations and penalties imposed by authority of the various state boards. So I think the takeaway there is to encourage the adoption of a uniform of procedures, right? And so I'll have you know that those words were written in the thoroughbred record on January 27th, 1934. Wow. I will tell you, basically, you just did the same thing Everybody else does when I tell them that they shake their head and they go, wow. So I think it might be time. I think it might be time for, for a different, a different path. And I think, um, at the core of that is the horse racing integrity act. Cause I think we're headed into, into 2020. I think we've given this enough time. When I look at that statement from all the racing commissioners from 1934, yeah, it is time. It's it is time. time. <laughs> On the topic of safety, we could take this conversation in many directions, but while we're while we branched off into safety, um, what about synthetic tracks? What are you thinking about the the um, push? Yeah, my 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 sense is that they're uh, they're safer and they're better designed than they were eight or ten years ago when when you know they put them in in California and took them out. That's an interesting thing and. I, you know, I'd like to say that I don't know enough about it. I, I don't, I don't, but I know there are people who really know about them. And, and I'd say like, not everybody knows is an expert on every different facet, but I do know if the powers that be, um, and the tracks, especially if they see, and the data indicates, and I I'd like to talk about the data aspect of our industry, but the data indicates that I think we could, we could go in and we don't need to go a hundred and fifty percent, right, right out the out of the um, out of the box. You know, there there probably are ways that that we can uh, we can incorporate it uh, the synthetic surfaces into our industry to kind of see if they provide a better result than they did before. But um, it's going to take owners and trainers and tracks and vets and and the manufacturers of, of the synthetic uh, you know the surfaces, but. I think that's a very, very intriguing option for us and you know, one of the things that can help us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, what we read is good about it, but you're right. The implementation is a whole other level of it. So implementation, testing, data. Yes. Um, and I think that's one of the things uh, 
that we're all starting to see. Like, like that is important. That is important. And, and, and the fact that we, we've done a lot of you know, different work to get into a position like like data for the sake of data doesn't do a whole lot. I know that, right? But data that is cultivated and I'd say curated in the right way is going to give you a the ability to extract value, right? And when you when you get data and you can extract value, that's what you're looking for. And I think that's what I see tracks are doing with track services and the vets and, and using, I know in New York, I know Dr. Palmer is doing really, really great work in evaluating the prediction factors. You know, a horse hasn't, is a gelding. He's, you know, I'm, you know, making this up. He's a gelding. He's six years old. He hasn't worked in 45 days uh, and he has one work and then he runs. Well, he's a, he is more at risk to injure himself than uh, a three-year-old who's only run three times. So, I think that there's a there's a, a big part for data to really play and to, to have a positive impact on our business, especially in safety. And do we have one place collecting that data? Do we have some, where that's getting distilled? Well, we uh, it's in the works. It's in the works. There's a uh, the you know, for example, there's a surface uh, I, I'd say office right that's at the University of Kentucky. Um, Right, that's underwritten in large part by the jockey club so that we have one place, one place in the center of the country where the data is going to come in and we're going to be able to evaluate uh, services all over the country using uh, the data that's extracted you know, from satellites and, and on the ground. And now all of a sudden you start to have the raw data um, in one place where the key to it is that you're going to have people that they eat, they sleep, uh, and they drink, right, track services. And that's all they're focused on. And, you know, how exciting is that to finally get a handle on that and to have one spot that, you know, people are thinking about, you know, they're going to study. What about sloppy tracks? What about seal tracks? What about what about sun? What about weather? All those things that, that kind of emanated from the issues out at Santa Anita, you know, now we have the ability to to apply the scientific, you know, process and and methodology to that analysis. So, I mean, that's one of the things. Like, you know, I'll talk about the jockey club. Like, there are a lot of things that they underwrite and uh, that people don't know about. You know, I know that a lot of people don't like the jockey club for one reason or another. I mean, there there are plenty of things I'm sure in the past, but it's it's a different jockey club now. You look at the people who are being elected and, and they're people who right, didn't grow up in the business and their, their grandfathers aren't. And, and so it's a great mix of people, but it's, it's amazing when you talk to people uh, right, that have the ass at the jockey club, as I say, you know, excuse the, you, the choice of words, but, and you talk to them and you say like, all right, what's your issue with the jockey club? And they talk this and that, and you and you walk them through the programs and the initiatives that they've underwritten and their plan for the next five years. Look, they're not always right. They're not always right, but they, you always know exactly where they stand and they put their money where their mouth is and they're looking to get better as an organization and they're looking for the industry to get better. And like, they're, they're an important part of our, of our business. And there's no person I've talked to since I've been elected that I've, I've given all the, all the materials, right. That haven't said, man, I didn't know about that. Or I didn't realize that, but man, that's pretty, you take a look at the body of work and look, I don't have to be a cheerleader for the jockey club. I really don't. Uh, I got no clients that are on the jockey club, but when you really dig into it, you really admire what they, what they stand for and where they, you know, the, the progress that they've made as an organization. And I, I think they're going to be a key component um, of the progress and the, the change that we're hopefully going to see in the next 10 years. Oh, that's, that's very hopeful. I'm excited to hear you say that. It's such a historic organization. It's awesome. Can we talk about uh, the responsibility of owners as you are one and you represent many of them? Uh, can we talk about yeah. the, where the owners come in? Yeah. It's, I go back to the culture aspect. Um, 
it doesn't work, right? Because the owner is the person that uh, is paying the bills. So the owner's got to be really cognizant and uh, tuned in to the right culture and and setting the standard um, on the culture side for their organization. Because they all, you know, you have an owner, you have one horse, you have 80 horses. Um, your, you know, your obligation in particular uh, to these horses is to make sure that your organization has a good culture. We don't always have the same culture, but it better, it should be a good culture. I know I look at it from a, I look at personally on the West Point Thoroughbred side and I look at our team and we've talked extensively in the last six months about, you know, we're not going, uh, we're not going to point fingers. Let's look inward. Every time you point a finger, there are three fingers coming back at you. And that's what I did. I, that's what we did as a team. Let's sit down. Let's look at the last five years of data. Where did, where did we place a horse that, that wasn't very smart? You know, we looked at our vet records and we looked at our, you know, who we had training horses and, you know, who we bought horses from and the horses that we, we don't breed a lot. But we really took a very um, a, a clinical view of the data that we have. And I, I think it's helped our, our, our culture. So that's what I'd say to owners is your responsibility, of course, is to pay your bills. But your responsibility is to set the tone for the culture in your organization and to continuously to, uh, to learn, right? Because we all know, right, it doesn't matter what industry, right? No one knows everything. And so the best owners that I see, and that's one of the things that I do, I, I study owners. What are they doing? What are they not doing? When they when they learn and they the, they utilize data and the you know, people and, and the right people and, and the right systems, you know, good things happen. And uh, we know it's a numbers game, but you know, culture, culture, culture is something is a, a buzzword and an area that I think is if we keep going back to it, it's going to help our industry immensely. How about in terms of aftercare of their athletes? Um, it, it, is it something that the owners should take a bigger hand in? Is it something that there should be percentages taken at sales going to aftercare? It's it's a tough situation, right? We know that twenty thousand horses are are. Are, are manufactured, are fold a year or, you know, in that range. And we've done a much better job than we did 10 years ago, but there's still a lot to do. So, um, yes, it's the personal accountability. And ultimately, ultimately, it goes back to that owner. And, and I know people say, well, what about the breeder? What about the trainer? You know, this person should be this part of, uh, of the industry should be paying more into it all, you know, someone's got to lead. You know, I learned that in the military, like hey, organizations that are optimized and that are, uh, that do the best are, are run by a leader and the owner has to lead in this endeavor. And, um, it's a never ending, you know, every year there, are, there are thousands of horses that come to the end of their racing career. You know, I can tell you that I'm comfortable um, with my daughter, Aaron, you know, she runs our retirement program and, and with, along with the rest of the team, we're all, but you just have to vow like no horse that ever, ever, ever carries the black and gold is ever going to is right. Not going to have a good retirement. And that's it. Now, obviously we have to execute, right? You have to execute. But when you go in with that, if everybody did that, this would be addressed. Uh, so I just say to other owners out there, step up and I take up accountability and be a leader. Oh, that's great. No, that's, that's excellent. Terry, you've got to be the leading authority on owners in terms of partnerships and syndications. I love partnerships. Um, and I, I never I never talk about about partnerships without talking about Cot Campbell, who was, uh, you know, uh, is a rock star in the in the thoroughbred business is in the hall of fame and 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 started the concept of partnerships but listen you know, partnerships are 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 the way to go <laughs> i'm biased but when i look at what it does to people I, i'll give you a quick story i have a um i have a, a surgeon in, in the midwest and he just came to us about 18 months ago and he was a little bit older very very well acclaimed a, a top surgeon uh, and he had gotten divorced about five years ago and, and he was kind of, 
he he was troubled. You know, he was struggling in his life, and he and he he'd always enjoyed the horses, and he finally he called me. We hit it off like about ten seconds into our first call, and so fast forward, you know, he's got about ten horses. He's in the brood mares, and we're at Keeneland, and he's a big guy. He's about six six two seventy, and. At the end of the day, I think we had run four, like a bad fourth, but it was a good day. It was a beautiful day, a, a normal Keeneland day. And he came up to me and he was, he was quivering a little bit. And he said, you've saved my life. Aww. And I was like, the, the emotion was like just over the top. And, uh, you know, that's what we have the ability to do. You don't have the ability to do that in, in, the vast majority of other places, but like, I'll never forget that till the day I die. I, I love partners and I, I love people who are, are, are so, so excited about, uh, about the business that they can, they're on the other side of the, of the velvet rope, as I say. And, and like those people, those people, you want to talk about advocates, like they're advocates out in the real world for our business in a huge way. And we just have to cultivate those people, but just know that, you know, back to what I was saying, we have the magic that every day on a regular basis, we have, we have a, a magic in the form of a racehorse that changes lives. Yeah, absolutely. I remember a couple of years ago, you and I spoke um, in an interview and just you describing what it was like to win the Kentucky Derby, but to win it with, as a team. And that it meant that much more to be standing there with teammates. And that just really struck me. I'll never forget that. Yeah. And I, I, I think about that. And I, I think even even people, the, the hard-edged owners that you see, and they just never seem happy. And they win a race at Saratoga. And they're in the winner's circle with the groom and the trainer and them. And even then, they don't look happy. But, but, but you know, when you can share it with people, what is life about? If you can't share experiences, and that's what's so beautiful about a business is you you can join a fancy club and yeah, you can you can walk around with a with a golf shirt from a, a fancy club and you'll see a bunch of fancy cars out in in front and 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 the same the same group of guys will talk about how much money they have, right? I'd much rather be in an environment where I want to every once in a while I can look at people and say, I had the fastest horse today. And, and, and so the community, the community aspect of our business is, is something that I really think, I really think will, will pay us you know, back in spades in the coming years. Cause look, this is a whole nother discussion, but social media and, and the, the, the volume of the, of, of the messaging and the news and everything that comes in at that, really comes at us with a, a fire hose, right? People are getting tired of that. Yeah. They really are. They're getting tired of just getting overrun. And you compare and contrast that to a beautiful morning at Saratoga with your, like I, I just had my grandson, and my first kid, and I can't wait to take him. At some point in the in the next year, we'll, we'll be at Saratoga together. And I'll, I'll be able to, to have those same feelings that I see because I, I, I knew that, at some point, we'd have a we'd have a grandchild, and so I would look at at people that would come to the backside at Saratoga with their grandkids, and I'd be like, "When is it going to be my turn?" And so, you don't do that at a golf course. You don't do that at, at tennis. You could you do it at the racetrack, and and so um, I I will tell my grandson Blake, I can't wait to get your uh, to get your little body up to up to Saratoga, and uh, you know, hopefully in the winter circle. All right, we hope you share those pictures on social media because there are still people waiting, <laughs> waiting on social media for the excitement. I will tell you, I'll give you an anecdote. Good. So he was born on August 1st uh, in, in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. And so we had run, uh, we were pretty active uh, this summer at Saratoga. And it was like right about 2, 220, uh, whatever. We were probably in the fourth race with a filly by the name of Tipple. And anyway, I'm sitting in the waiting room and I had known, right, uh, actually my wife Debbie had said when she has the baby, uh, they'll play a melody on the intercom in the hotel or in the hotel and in the hospital. And so I was waiting and we knew we were getting closer and closer. I had my iPad up and it 
we turn for home. And I think we're in a pretty good spot. And of course it, it, you know, the iPad goes out. I mean, it locks right, <laughs> right with the stream. So anyway, about three minutes later, they, they play the melody and I knew it, not a big hospital. So I said, that's my grandson and my daughter, my son-in-law, Daniel. And at the same, as soon as the last note played on that melody, my iPad came up and they're walking the Philly into the winner's circle at Saratoga. And you had won. And we had won. Oh my God. That's, now, that's overwhelming. That, that was overwhelming. Now, you know, two minutes later, I looked down and, and they claimed our Philly, <laughs> but, but <laughs> who cares? Like I had never been uh, you, you know, so unmoved by, by a horse, uh, a winner getting claimed. But, uh, you know, I, I just, I took that as like, you know, racing has given me and my family and the partners they, you know, racing and these horses have given us our lives. Like this is all I've ever done except in the military. And I, I just thought that was a culmination and kind of the, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that, uh, you know, that melody. Um, and, and I'd say the juxtaposition of my family that I love and the business I love and everything coming together. I, I don't know. I, I know we all have, have stories and that's one of the things that this business right affords us the ability is to make memories. And August 1st of, of, of 2019, I'll never forget that day. The business is not short on emotion. That's for sure. And it, one, one other thing that you just reminded me of when we talked a couple of years about, what was the major uh, issue facing the industry was how to attract new owners. And I think that your partnership is doing such a great job at that. And that will then branch out into uh, the image as well, because you're constantly bringing in new people and uh, giving them a chance to see the inside. Yes. And, you know, one of the things I, I get, I probably don't get it quite as much, but we all know there are a lot of partnerships out there, right? The barriers to entry are not real, real high, to you know, form a partnership. All you got to do is get a stable name and say, "Hey, I'm I'm looking for partners," which is great. Look, it's great. It's you know that the more people, I, of course, we'd like every new partner in the business, right? What partnership manager wouldn't? I would just say that if you're if you're trying to do a partnership, right? I, I this is all we do. This is all I eat, breathe, and sleep. Right, partnerships, and and one of the things that I've really especially over over the last what nine months it's been driven home to me is it's it's about relationships and it's about one-on-one -on -one. like i i hear people say well i'm going to get a bunch of rich people together and we're going to put a bunch of money into a pot and we're going to go to keeneland september and you know what that works for a time until it doesn't and and so it's got to be one-on-one -on -one. your people uh that have the wherewithal to get into our uh, the horse business, for the most part, they've worked really, really hard for their money and they want it applied and and they want to spend it and invest it, you know, in a way that, uh, you know, they can be proud of. And you can't do that in groups. I know we are a group, but we're one on one. And I, I, you know, I know my team, I want I want to be held accountable and I want to hold my team accountable that we're we're doing it and we're providing the one-on-one -on -one and we're looking people in the eye and we're saying, we have your horse's best interest at the forefront and we have your best interest in the forefront. So we have four, four paradigms that we work with uh, at, at our company, West Point. We want to take care of the horse. We want to always put them at the, at the front. We want to continue to work on actually getting a hold of a better and better horses, right? The selection process. Uh, three, um, we want to um, take care of our partners, obviously, and and to give them a great experience. And four, we want a sustainable company that we can be. We've been around for 29 years. We want to be around for another 29 years. The whole business is encapsulated by those four pillars, and and that is absolutely the you know the prioritization of those four pillars is uh, just that: the horses, the selection process, the partners, and the company. And, you know, if you continuously refer back to that, I'll suggest to you that, you know, as a company, you know, you're going to do all right. Uh, that sounds good. Do, what, do we have anything we're looking forward to in 2020, West Point? Always. It's a, as I said, it's uh, hopes and dreams. And, uh, you know, we just ran a horse together. Uh, we had 
we paid two million for him. His name is uh, Chestertown, and uh, we nice. bought him. He was the he was the the sale topper at March, and you know, I, I it's really funny. We bought a couple sales toppers, and all because of our partners, right? It's all based on them in the last you know couple of years, and you, people congratulate you, congratulate you, and it's it's kind of, it's to a certain extent empty because you kind of walk away and you say like, wait a second. That's just, this is just the beginning of the journey. Like, and we know the vast majority of them, those big dollar horses don't work out. So look, we're, we're in a position where we've got a couple that are on the cusp. I think we've tried to get away from, you know, those horses that, that run a hole in the wind in July and August, right? We'd much rather win in November and December to get ready for their three-year-old years. And, and so it's a, it's a strategy that, you know, we try to make work. It doesn't always work, but you know, when, when you're sitting on at the beginning of, of December and you got some good three-year-olds or you got some good two-year-olds that are going to be three-year-olds in about three weeks, man, you, you want to talk about getting your, your blood flowing. And, um, you know, that's what keeps everybody coming back. You're not losing your excitement for the game. I can tell. No. And I, I love being in an industry where I see people just as engaged and invigorated um, and excited about our industry as, as I did 20 years ago. And what industry, what industry where you, right, do you have outside of racing that you can truly say people get more into it? Like, I'm more into it. I'm more like I'm, I'm look, I love the fact that there's a there's a generation right behind me and behind us <laughs> that, um, hey, they're movers and shakers. You know, I, I could list the names. I don't want to leave anybody off. But, you know, people that are doing it uh, on the racetrack and they're winning the biggest races and they're bringing process to areas of our business that never had process before and that they're using social media and they're. They're setting a high bar and I love that. And like, I'm, I'm, they invigorate me and the people ahead of me and, uh, you know, the, the generation ahead, uh, they invigorate and, and look, I, I want to invigorate other people too, because like when you have a group of people that are invigorated and dedicated and passionate, you know, you have a lot better shot than if they're not. That's right. That's right. So you're going to look to increase the team. Yeah. And I, I look, I mean, there are, there really are. And I don't say that just cause we're, we're doing a, a podcast for the TDN, but there are some really good partnerships out there. So again, you know, competition is good. Like that's what we, we, that's at the core of our business, right? Horses and competition. So, um, I really like when partners or potential partners, when they say to us, man, you, you guys have really tried to stay, at the forefront of technology and communication and customer service and uh, the experience. And I, I love that because yes, that's important, right? But I also love when they say, but you also have worked hard on your acquisition process and your management. You, you do a better job in your management. I think we are, but it's always good to hear that, but we're very critical of ourselves, right? And that's the beautiful thing about our business is we have the finish line. So we have metrics and that's the biggest, right? Met you talk, talk about metrics. Like there's one metric above and beyond anything is the finish line. So um, it's, it's a lot easier to kind of gauge our performance um, in the horse industry. And I like that. And, you know, most people that are in our business or right, for the long run, they like that too. Oh, I love that. And I'm, and I always feel more optimistic about the business talking to you. I appreciate that. And I'd like to, you know, that's, we have a good number of problem identifiers and, uh, you know, we have to increase our supply of, of the doers and, uh, and the problem solvers and, um, look, people, they're all well-intentioned. I don't have, I don't, I can't look at any single person in the entire industry that isn't well-intentioned. Right. Because I say, if you're not well intentioned, there are easier ways to make a living and there are easier ways to uh, to to get your juice and, and to, you know, to get your excitement in the in the world. Um, 
I, I think they, they all play second fiddle to the excitement and the juice that we have as an industry and as owners and trainers and other people who are, you know, betters, especially, I know we didn't talk about betters a whole lot, but you know, I, I've, I've really, really ad- adopted a better and I think a, a more long-term and, and strategic outlook towards the betting and the better, um, I don't bet a whole lot. I do bet, but I don't bet a lot. And I'm, I try to be as strategic as, as possible. But, you know, I think I go back to Joe Applebaum. He's a professional gambler and he's a pin hooker. He's in every aspect of our business. But it's I don't think there's another leader of a horseman's organization that even comes close to having the kind of experience that Joe has in the betting on the betting side of things. It's helped us immensely to to never let us forget that the two entities that drive our whole business are owners and betters. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is really important not to forget. Absolutely. Well, can we talk a little bit about the state of racing in California right now? We can. We can. Um, I, I'll, I'll start with the positive. Like, there's a lot of opportunity out there, you know, with people leaving and, and getting out of the business and, you know, going to Oakland for the winter. Like, it's a good spot to campaign horses and we've we've never had more horses than we have uh, today out in california have about 25 horses so in that respect it it's good certainly there are challenges and again the disruption that's occurred i hope that we'll look back and we'll say that disruption right led to all these positive changes because really it it has it's it's all these initiatives and changes and and the the improvement of our culture emanate right from the trials and tribulations of of the last year in California. So, you know, um, I know Pete is getting a lot of attention. I I know it, and um, um, they they are a force to be reckoned with. And look, I don't spend a lot of time, and I I don't waste my mind space. You know, they're unfair, and they shouldn't be doing this, doing that. But they're there, and um, um, if we keep improving our culture and we keep putting the horse first, then I think PETA will be taken care of. I hope so. I mean, there, there are a lot of PETA members in California. So that is a, <laughs> in a state that, you know, requires a certain number of signatures. I think they make that in, in PETA members alone. Yeah. And, and look, there are a lot of parallels right between California and New York, just from the, the, the demographics and the, the, their coastal states and the, uh, you know, the, the levers of power uh, in Sacramento and Albany. So uh, don't think that we're not paying really, really close attention uh, to the political uh, dynamic of this entire situation in California, because I know it's 3000 miles, but it ain't, there's not that much of a difference between California and and New York. But um, I don't think any of us would be in this business if we didn't like challenges. What about bisphosphonates? And that's been a, a huge thing this year, the bisphosphonates, when we're talking about the breakdowns um, as a possible contributor. There probably hasn't been any other aspect of our business that has really ripped my heart out more than uh, what's happened on the bisphosphonate front. And, and so last spring, it just really hit me. You know, the, the Horsemen's Organization and... Uh, the alphabet soups and, and, and look, we had, we had all acknowledged it, but I think we're all in the same spot. Like, what do we do about it? And, and, you know, basically it was very, very good to see how the industry coalesced around, Hey, we got to stamp this out. Basically when you give a yearling, right? Bisphosphonates or a two-year-old you're in some cases, you're giving them a death sentence. It's like, are you kidding me? Right. Are you kidding me to take away sesamoiditis or not take it away to cover it up? Right. Are you kidding me? And and like, I, I tell you, I, if 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 there was ever you know a way, and and look, the past is the past, but to think that veterinarians and consigners and others, right, were were complicit in administering a drug that they knew was really just to cover up an issue that was gonna, was gonna make the issue worth is like unconscionable. 
Um, I won't buy a horse. I'm going to, every time I buy a horse, and we buy a lot of horses, we're pr- probably in the top top 10 or 15. I'm going to look the uh, the consigner in the in the eye, and, and I'm going to ask that question in particular on the bisphosphonate side. And I'd suggest everybody else do that too. And I'm not going to accept, well, you know, this horse, he just shipped in, so I I haven't given him. No, I, I said, well, then I'm walking away. And I, I don't know. We... We've made a lot of strides since the spring on bisphosphonates, but um, I tell you, if you if you're a veterinarian and you're in Central Kentucky or anywhere else, and you walk into a yearling stall um, and you administer uh, the drug, right, bisphosphonate, I mean, you are a bad actor, and you don't deserve you don't deserve uh, to participate and and to make a living in this business and. You know, that's the way I feel. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So let's talk. Let's talk turkey, right? You, you're you're not you're gonna you can take a, a blood test or you can take a test um, at the sale, but it's administered four, five, six months before, and it's out of the system. So look, there's there are some logistical issues there, but you know, there again, um, that shouldn't stop us. We're smart enough and we're good enough as an industry to figure this out. But, um, hey, you know, the vets are, are part of this. And, and uh, I know Dr. Burke, who's the, uh, a very, very well-respected veterinarian, especially at the sales, is the head of the AAEP and has really brought a new spirit to the political side of, of veterinarians. And, and I think it was uh, really, really a, a good time. And I think it was Providence that somebody like Dr. Burke took control in uh, the top spot uh, at the AEP. So I think things are coming together. I really do. But you know, please don't let me or uh, you'll find out um, that you've administered the drug to a yearling because, like, you know, that's really fighting. That 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 action is uh, a precursor to a, a fight because it's. It's the worst thing you could ever do to a horse, is to is uh, to put him on the path of a ticking time bomb, and that's what it's sad that we have to address a situation like this, and it, it uh, long overdue. But um, I'm glad we did it. Yeah, well, Barbara Benke did set a, a strong example this year in their series of testing, and they would test the yearlings every thirty. I don't want to quote this wrong it was either every 30 or 60 days but in in increments of time where the drug couldn't be out of their system and then she had a series of proof that that none of her horses yeah. would be treated with that so look i know there's a cost involved in, in an investment so and i don't know exactly you know what the protocol would be but hey the onus is on on the consigners and the breeders right um in essence Let's let's talk turkey. Let's face facts. Right, a lot of the confidence, right, that we have as buyers, right, that that confidence has has been altered and it's been affected, very straightforwardly. And it doesn't it doesn't pass the smell test. To, you know, and I've talked to some big consigners, and they say we didn't even know about it. We had to ask our vet, and I'm like, well, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Wow, that's about uh, that, that. You know, that's a believable statement. But listen, um, we're we're. I hope we're over the hump. But um, again, we all have to be hold be held accountable. I hope. Right, this is a a black mark on our industry, and I hope the black mark is in the past. Yeah. Um, but if it's not, those people, uh, you know, they they should be identified. And um, if you do it. You should be man enough to stand up and say, I did it. Yeah, back up. Or woman enough. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, give us a chance to address the issue with the horses that are already in the system. Because, look, I mean, from what I've been told, it's been in, it's been in the system for a long time. And, and so what do we have? We have six or seven iterations that are on the racetrack, uh, crops. So I would say not our proudest moment as a thoroughbred industry, but we always you always make progress when you ask the hard questions and you identify uh, the things and you're transparent and and you and you go forward and that's what the industry is going to do with 
uh, on the issue of bisphosphonates. That's excellent. And that reminds me to ask you uh, about the two-year-old and yearling sales. Yeah. So especially the two-year-old sales, I, I just, look, I'm one player. I mean, we're, we're one team. We're very active. We've been active at the two-year-old sales for 25 years. I think we can do better at the two-year-old sales. You know, I, I, again, I, I, I've learned in life that a good barometer is the ability to look somebody in the eye. And I can't find a single person that I can look in the eye uh, or, or they can look at me and, and, and be confident that we're doing the right things by these two-year-olds. I know a person has should have the ability to to implement their own training program because they bought the horses. But that doesn't mean that they have carte blanche. That doesn't mean that they can do whatever they want. That goes back to the culture that we talked about. And I, I don't know. I think we're we're smart enough, and there are enough there are enough players that that really have done well and have uh, you gone to the two year old sales and and you know bought horses and sold horses and. It's a good market, but we can do better. And, and I challenge the consigners, the buyers, and the sales companies to put their heads together and, and you'll figure out. It's not going to change all in one year, but let's see incremental progress and incremental improvement, ultimately, again, to take care of the horse. For the safety of the horse. Yes. Safety of the horse first. It would be taking care of the industry as a whole. It would. It would. It, 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 it just you 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 take a look at the ripple, and every at every step it's better. You get you 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 sell a sounder horse. You have better you you happier owners. The trainers are are happier. You you fill more races, and and you you get better horses into our into the in the into the gene pool, and then it propagates itself. And that's what we need. We need a good shot in the arm right like that and you don't get a good shot in the arm unless you you formulate a, a a better plan to make things to improve things and and we can do that we've done it we've done it you know i know there's an economic element and there's a balance there right what i'm saying in general in 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 total is we have to identify and address in particular when that balance is out of sync by a little bit or by a lot I mean, 2020 is a, a watershed year for us. Let's do it. Like, what else else do we have? Let's, let's, we can make this business better for the, for the better. We can make it better for the owner, the trainer, but we can especially, especially make it better in 2020 for the horse. For the athletes themselves. Absolutely. Um, anything else? Yes. So 2020 is going to be a big year in our industry. We know that. And so it's about, um, it's about culture. It's about accountability and, um, let's be nice to each other. Let's talk. We don't need to yell. We don't need to scream. We can put our differences on the table, but every day let's do the right thing every day. And I think the cumulative effect of all of us that are so passionate about this business, the cumulative effect, um, I know, will be very positive. And I know if we come back here, I'd like to, I'd like to set a date to, uh, to talk on this podcast in, at the end of 2020. And, and, you know, my vision and our vision is that things are really going to advance. And we're, we're finally, we're finally going to see the substantive changes that we've been looking for as an industry for a lot of years. And we're all going to be better off. And the and the real benefactor, the real benefactor of that work uh, day by day by day is who? It's the horse. That's great. That's the best. Well, it's a date. A year from now, let's talk again. And as I said before, speaking with you, I always feel more energized and more optimistic. Um, you always look at things as opportunities challenges, opportunities, not problems. And in my mind, uh, that makes a great leader. And I thank you. Well, I will give you some background on that. One of the greatest lead, probably the greatest leader I ever had the pleasure to, uh, to serve under uh, was a colonel in, in uh, Germany when I was a, a second lieutenant. And I remember one day we we're out in the field and I was talking about a problem. You know, he, I was a second lieutenant, a butter bar. And he said, Lieutenant Finley, 
There are no problems. There are just challenges. And that's always stuck with me. And I, I try to never use the, the term a problem. I always, I always address it as a challenge. And, and that attitude comes right through. I didn't know that that line was important to you, but it, it, just, it just came through to me uh, that that's always the way you speak. So thank you for your service. And thank you for coming here and talking. It was great. Absolutely. My pleasure, Patty. Really appreciate it. So that's all for this podcast. You can find all the TDN podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the TDN website, where you'll find a podcast tab on the homepage. The TDN Writer's Room podcast is new every Wednesday and is an excellent wrap-up of the week with great insight from our writers. Uh, I particularly love that podcast. I live for it. Uh, Tune in again soon. This is Patty Wolf saying goodbye for now.